Welcome to the Inspired to be Authentic podcast. I'm your host, Matt Lancedale. Inspired to be Authentic is a podcast where we converse with people who are living their most authentic lives. We get real with our guests and talk openly about how they live with courage to be themselves. We explore barriers they have overcome to be more authentic and aligned to themselves and their purpose. Today is episode three, and we are going to be talking about masculinity, shame, and authenticity, and how this impacts our ability to be able to show up as ourselves. I have a very special guest today, a very special friend, uh, Blake Spence. I want to welcome you. Hi. <laughs> so Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, you bet. It's great for you to be able to come on. Um, I want to do, share a little bit about you, and then we'll, we'll get started. So um, Blake is from Calgary, Canada. He's repping 403. That's my hometown. Very proud to be from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. He has worked in the nonprofit sector for 10 years and run his own LGBTQ focused event company, uh, which we'll be talking a lot about that in this, uh, this episode as well. In 2012, he started a successful nationally recognized and award winning school based program for young men called Wise Guys. Wise Guys aimed to teach young men about sexual health, healthy relationships and healthy masculinity. In 2015, he was invited to offer a TED talk on how his own experience shaped his work in Wise Guys and the LGBT community. So a lot of great stuff there. I, that, this, this is the, the reason why I wanted to have you on today is because um, you offer such a, a, a great uh, perspective and expertise in this area. And uh, I really want to pick your brain and kind of see what, what gems came out of your work with, uh, with Wise Guys. But um, why don't we just start a little bit about talking, um, maybe I can get you to talk a little bit about who you are. Like what, what, what's, uh, what's your passion? What, what fires you up? <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. You're also doing a lot of really great work and uh, you've got your first book out, um, which I did just get in the mail and I'm excited to dig into it. So congrats on, uh, on all of, uh, all of the work you've been doing, Matt. Oh. I think you should have a lot to be proud, uh, a lot to be proud of. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, Blake. <clears throat> uh, what am I passionate about? Uh, so right now I'm passionate about spending time at home. Uh, <laughs> yeah we have to uh, it's a good spin <laughs> whoa spending a lot of time at home uh yeah. digging in real deep to getting to know myself uh yeah. and what like you know what what keeps me uh happy in times of crises like when right now um yeah. but otherwise you know i really like spending time with friends i like to connect uh, with people which i'm realizing is something that i'm missing right now uh that like personal <clears throat> intimate connection <clears throat> It's, it's obviously great to connect with people on the phone and, and yeah. doing what we're doing right now, but I miss that. Yeah, uh, me too. Being outside, hanging out with my doggy, playing hockey, um, <clears throat> coming up with ideas of how uh, I really like to entertain, which is part of my 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 my, my business. You know, coming with ideas. It's like, what is an event that I think people will be excited about? That people want to come to that would be a unique, uh, memorable experience that gets me really fired up and, and mm. really excited, which is why I I do what I do. Um, music, food, horror movies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sex. Sex. Yeah. yeah. Types of things. <laughs> Some, something that I noticed about you and actually we have this in common is we both love to bring community together. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's, it's what is it about bringing community together that gets you excited? Uh, I think it's, so there's some people that just like really thrive off of that. And, and I think you and I are, are similar that way. Yeah. Um, it brings me joy to provide people with like a good time, you know, and yeah. like something to sort of break up the monotony of like the day to day. It's like a lot of us get stuck in the routine of doing the same thing often. And it's nice to kind of jump out of that and like do something different where you might, you're connected with friends or you're connected with family, but it's just might be in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's like, you know, having a dinner party or going dancing or, you know, listening to live music or, or singing karaoke or whatever it might be. It's just, yeah. uh, for me, it's, it's gratifying. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 it like recharges me. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel the same way? Um, oh, very much so. Yeah. Like I, I, I see so much of myself in you. It's crazy. And, and um, I just watched your Ted talk before we got on the, on the call because I had watched it a while ago, but I wanted to refresh on it. And just, the, you know, all the things that you said about pogs and your mushroom cut and your Chandler Bing shirt. And it's, <laughs> it's basically, I'm just looking at a mirror of myself. So it's, it's really cool. And I felt like that ever since the day I met you really, there's so many commonalities between you and I and um, yeah. Eighties boys, eighties, eighties, boys. 80s growing up boys. in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. It's really, uh, really cool. Um, so why don't we talk a bit about uh, Wise Guys? Why don't you just introduce what, what that is and what, you know, how you got involved in it? And we'll talk a bit about that because I think that's going to set the, the stage for kind of digging into some of this sure. stuff you want to go into. Yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of a long convoluted story that I will try to make concise so it's okay. easy to understand. Okay. I'll, do, I'll do my very best. Okay. So I worked in sexual health for a long time. Um, I volunteered when I was like fresh out of high school. I saw this like opportunity to volunteer at the sexual health center and I did. And, and it was a really gratifying experience. We'd like go to concerts and hand out condoms and like talk openly about sex and relationships. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Cause I never had that experience growing up mm -hmm. um, learning about sex. It was like something that I kind of had to teach myself. I remember I found my parents joy of sex book and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is sex, but it didn't include anything gay. So I was like, well, yeah. I guess I don't fit into that. <clears throat> That's yeah. a whole story. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I ended up going to school and then I got, a, I got contacted by the sexual health center. Like we're starting this program for boys and we thought that you might be interested in like and, and running it. And so I took the job and I um, <clears throat> started this program and, and initially the program was like, we need to teach boys about condoms. And like, mm -hmm. that's the, the funder wants boys to learn about condoms. And so I, w I went to these, uh, a bunch of different places to see like what age group would be the best fit. And through trial and error, um, it seemed to be like grade nine boys, 14, 15 year old boys were the most eager to have those types of conversations. Yeah. And so I started doing the work in junior high schools. Okay. Uh, and so I would meet with these boys and we would, you know, I would do my little lesson plan, like, you know, let's talk about sex and condoms. And uh, the boys would be obviously interested to learn about that. Cause you know, you're 14. That's very exciting to learn mm -hmm. about sex yeah um, but they'd also want to talk about a lot of other things they'd want to talk about some of the pressures they felt by you know around being a, a boy and what that meant that they had to show up um, a certain way to certain social situations mm -hmm. and like they were asking me like what I thought about that and like how I my, my experiences were if I, if I had those experiences growing up and uh, <clears throat> I did I of course did and I think a lot of men do <laughs> And the program grew to become a lot more <clears throat> involved than just talking about condoms and sexual health. And it, it became a, a program where we really dug into what it means to be a man in our society and how we're taught to be a man and like what is okay and what isn't okay for men to be like. Um, that's also, also in relation to sex and sexuality. And like, why, why do we, we see, you know, uh, men being overly violent often um, with each other or with their partners or why did, why is there sexual abuse or sexual assault happening often at the hands of men? And it was like, we really dug in mm. to the concepts of, of masculinity and what it, what it meant to be a man. And, and then the program just continued to, to snowball and grow and uh, became a, a, a huge thing. And yeah. it was in a bunch of like in, in 12 schools. And uh, I, I hired a whole team of guys to go out into the community and do this work. And uh, boys kept wanting to sign up and, and to do it. So we, we, we kept growing with it. That's amazing. What, uh, what's so your, concise. yeah, no, that's perfect. What's your, um, your greatest takeaway from that? Like something that surprised you in doing that work for, cause you did it since 2012. So you did it for eight years or well, seven, yeah. right? Cause you, you've been working with the Alex for a while, right? So seven, seven or eight I left, years. So yeah, I left the sexual health center a year ago yeah. um, <clears throat> for, other reasons and but um, yeah. so but one of the biggest takeaway was that like as much as like things have gotten better in terms of like uh, our social <clears throat> uh, climate and this and the culture around gender and sexuality things have obviously gotten better but they also have remained very much the same in a lot of ways yeah like and, and what I mean by that is like yeah people might be more comfortable to talk openly about <clears throat> um, sexual orientation and they might know somebody who's gay or they you know but they might there's representation out there but the idea of what it means to be a man um is still very regimented and like yeah. that's held up by by you know a lot our society and by our fathers often and by yeah. the, the men that we look up to exactly. um, my my dad was certainly like that with me growing up you know like he wanted to have a jock son and yeah. And he tried really hard to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm grateful for like learning how to play all the sports because now that comes in handy. But like at the <laughs> time I wanted to do other things. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that's one, that's one example. Okay. You, and, and it's interesting because you, you made me think of my work in addiction counseling and how we do this work in group settings and then we send these addicts back into their family systems and they end up falling back into the same patterns and habits because it's ingrained in our subconscious, right? So the, 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 how we understand and believe around our masculinity happens, it, it first happens in our family system and we see the roles our parents play out, which is an energy exchange, right? And uh, we learn to very quickly repress the feminine aspects of our, of our masculinity. And that's, I think, becomes a, a very big issue in, in um, not only being a man, being a gay man as well, is, is you see that a lot in the gay community too. Um, can you speak a little bit to that about the repression of the feminine uh, energy? Oh yeah. <clears throat> like from my own personal experience, it was something that I was taught at a very young age that it was not okay to do anything feminine. And like, I learned this through my own, you know, upbringing with my, in my family, but I also learned it from other boys. Yeah. Like it was, it was policed. Like I remember being in grade, I don't know, three. And I really liked to like dress up to go to school and I would wear like nice clothes and dress shoes. And like, I would get made fun of, I would call every name in the book. Cause I was mm -hmm. like, you know, not playing soccer and playing baseball. I wanted to look, I wanted to look cute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, I learned to like push that down and like hide that and like, okay, for me to be safe and for me to feel um, comfortable, I have to try my very best to, uh, you know, yeah. not do that. I didn't, I didn't do a very good job, but I did try. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and what does that do? What does that do for us? Cause I did the exact same thing. We become self, so self monitoring and we're watching ourselves all the time. What does that do for our authenticity? Or what I'll speak, I'll put it on to you. What is What did that do for your authenticity to always having to be monitoring yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think um, a lot of gay folks are not authentic when they're growing up. I think growing up <clears throat> gay, and like, especially if you're, if you, you are drawn to feminine traits, you, you can't be authentic because you're going to get potentially hurt or you're going to get made fun of, or you're going, you're going to be, you know, made to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, um, I lost my train of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> repeat the question to me um, as far as being feminine how does being feminine um, make you or, or I guess I should say the repression of the feminine how does that impact our authenticity right well it just it, it prevents it, it makes it impossible yeah in, in my experience like you just can't be authentic if you're constantly monitoring parts of yourself to or hiding parts of yourself mm -hmm. to to feel safe yeah. <clears throat> from yeah. other people's actions, right? So like <clears throat> I, I think you 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 grow up into this person that you are you aren't fully rec realized as a person because you you held it in for so long until you find a, a play a people that accept you for who you are and a community that accepts you for who you are. Um <clears throat> it's it's going to constantly be like that. You can't be authentic if you're yeah. always trying to repress that part of yourself. Exactly, you know? yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. That's kind of what I'm going through right now in my life is I've, I've built up all these, these masks and these personas and these facades about who I was. And a lot of them were built into the, uh, the belief around masculinity. And now I'm really learning how to embrace the feminine aspects of, of being human. We all have feminine and masculine inside of us. Every single human being on this planet does. We need oh, for sure. that. Right. And even, even biologically, we start out as a, as a female chromosome and we, we accumulate the male chromosome to become a male right? X, Y come together. And right. So we all, it's, it's, it's actually ingrained in our biology to have this and, and not just in our energy, but, um, and now I'm, what I'm doing is I'm kind of like unpicking these parts of myself that aren't, aren't, they, they aren't essentially me, but they're just not serving me anymore too. Right. And it's, that's why I've been st started inspired to be authentic because it's really about how can we peel back the things that don't serve us anymore? We don't need them. So we can move and clear a way to, to step into all that we want to become. Right. Um, right. for, for yourself, what would be one thing that you, um, feel like gets, uh, is a barrier to your own authenticity? Uh, well, I, 
it's interesting because I was talking about until you find the community that accepts you. And I think when you like um, come out as gay, you're like, well, I'm going to have this gay community now that's just going to accept me. And we're all, you know, we're all in this together. <laughs> yep, and then you yep. realize quite quickly that there's like a hierarchy within gay, gay ma male culture, particularly yeah. <clears throat> around physicality, around masculinity. And those things are valued totally, <clears throat> higher yeah. than, than feminine traits or different body types. And we're all sort of like trying to be like, you know, get attention or get um, validated by looking good or, or portraying ourselves in a certain way. And of course, social media just sort of heightens that. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've done it. I've totally done it. I've been guilty yeah. of it. Yeah. Of um, and I, con have. I continue, I continue to, and it's like, I, and I notice it <clears throat> and it's like, is this like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> it's like, I look yeah. at Instagram and I, and I want to think that that like is a, a representation of who I am, but it's it's like something that's been curated yeah <laughs> yeah does that so, make sense yeah it totally does and i i love this question i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you i, I, I want to try and ask all my guests this so let's say you have a hundred percent right who you are when nobody's watching no cameras are on nothing like that that's you in totality that's 100 percent of you how much of you do you bring out into the world when you go outside of your home like i think now I think I bring a lot more now. I think as we get yeah, older, of course, we just stop yeah. caring. We just, you stop caring as much about what other people think about you and you stop worrying about, you know, all of that. Like it's still there, but it's, it's not as important. Yeah. And so a percentage, if I, if I were to say, it depends on the day. Yeah. Especially right now. Fuck. Yeah. Um, sorry, I swore. Um, <laughs> it's all good. A percentage on a, on a, on a great day, I'm going to say, you know, a solid 85. Yeah, I like that. That's good. That's good. And, and there's there is an element of of saving some stuff for just you too. I oh, like yeah. that because it's like why would I want to bring forth all of myself? Because it almost becomes boundaryless. Where right? we want to have some boundary in who we share ourselves with and who we want to be open with. Because why would I want to bring forth all of my being to everybody? Because not everybody deserves and 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 has earned to get to see me in my totality. That's a big part of it too. I want somebody to show up um, and be able to, to allow me to see them just as much as I want them to see me. And, but it's a very interesting thing. Brene Brown has this thing called the, the vulnerability paradox. And that's where we all want people to show up and be completely transparent with us, but we don't want to be the same way with them because we are afraid of rejection. We're afraid of judgment and all these things. Um, so it's very, um, it's very fascinating if we can really um, look at that percentage every day and be like, how much of me do I want to show up as today? And uh, right. it's, a, it's a beautiful question to always ask, ask ourselves. <clears throat> no, that's a really great point. And it, it depends on the context, you know, like in, the, in terms of like showing up at, at work, for example, you know, like how much of my true self am I going to bring to work? Like we all kind of have to filter ourselves a bit when it comes mm -hmm. to being professional, et cetera. Um, yeah. Versus when you're going on a date with somebody because you, you definitely want to come across as more authentic. Exactly. When you go yeah. on a date because you're, you know, you're trying to like, you know, yeah. sell yourself essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> One of the things I noticed in the gay community is that's a real struggle because I think it, as gay men, we grow up learning to hide aspects of ourselves. And I feel one of our biggest fears as gay men is rejection, right? Rejection is very, very painful for a lot of gay men. And which is why you see a lot of these really nasty things on Grindr when people reject each other, they're, they're, they become very, almost like rage comes out. And um, so, and I think that that really attributes to the hierarchy, right? We grow up learning, learning uh, self animosity. And when right. we don't feel like we accept ourselves, how on earth can we accept other people? So the gay community is, it can be very malicious and it can be very, um, very hurtful. But in my, in my opinion, I can see through it. I see through the veil and it's because we don't accept, accept ourselves in totality. So um, I wonder what, like, what comes up for you when, when I say that? Do you agree and disagree or do you have that same experience as I do or? Yeah, no, I would agree with what you're saying. I think that, um, I think growing up gay in an, in and of itself is a, is a traumatic experience. Definitely. And if yeah. you don't, if you don't deal with that, if you're not able to deal with that, or if you don't have a support network where you can talk about some of those experiences and so, and like face it and, and, and accept it then that's going to come out in some pretty ugly ways and that's i think why we see a lot of the stuff that we see and like you go on to grinder and you see all the you know 
headless torsos, the people don't even want to show their face because they're so ashamed of the fact that they're, they're there. They're, yeah. they're looking for some sort of connection, whether that's sexual or emotional or whatever it may be. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's just like, how, how can, how can, how, what is this going to result in? Where do we go from here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but then at the same time, I see myself like, you know, messaging those guys sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I'm a part of it. Yeah, of course. Um, one of the, one question I have for you is how your desire to connect, whether that's, yeah. that's sexual, uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever that is for you, however you define connection, how has your, your, um, desire to connect in your twenties changed from your desire to connect in your thirties? Can you talk a bit about each and what they both look like? Yeah, good question. In my 20s, I mean, there's so, your 20s are just like such an, an intense time because you're like, I'm an adult and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, you start to explore sexuality, you start to explore dating and, and booze and drugs potentially and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> And that in my twenties, I was just so unsure of myself. And I would often, I've noticed I would often go for, for guys that would like not be very nice to me. Mm. And I would like make it a, 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 I would constantly try to be like, I will get this guy to like me. Like, why doesn't he like me? Mm. And the guys that did like me, I would be like, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go for this You're guy. My plan B. Me like, yeah. I'm going to go for this guy that's treating me like shit because I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> And then in my thirties, um, I, Why, well, let's, I let's actually, I want to pause you for a second. Why do you think that is? Cause I think, I think there's a party that does know, like, why do we attract people that, that play on our self-worth that, that, that they, they're un, unattainable. Like why do we, what, what makes them desirable to us? Because I'm the same. Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's a million dollar question. Yeah. I thought that that was like something of the past, but I very recently went to, did something very similar. I was like, I feel like I'm back in my twenties again. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm going for this guy that's clearly not, you know, giving me what I need. Like, what is the attraction? I don't understand. Like he's yeah. literally done nothing to make me feel good. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm yeah. like, I have to, it, it's like almost like a challenge. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'll, I'll share I'm, a little bit about mine. It might, it might give you. Some yeah, please do. But, please do. Um, so what I've noticed for me is it's become a self-worth thing because in my life, male figures for me have represented emotional unavailability. So it's not so much about a sexual thing. The sex just happens to play out in that. So what I'm looking for is emotional connection. But when somebody withholds that emotional connection, it reminds me of my experience as a young child looking for, for a, emotional affection from somebody that wasn't able to give it to me as far as a male right. figure. And right. um, so when I look in a room and I see a, a room of people, all the people could be checking me out. But the one guy that's not checking me out, I will be immediately sexually and, and chemistry uh, attracted to him. Because I'm like, oh, it's a, and it's, it's a game. Because I, it's, it's like I'm trying to recreate a scenario with a, with a different outcome that's in my favor this time around. So right. I keep trying to put myself in this game of trying to have the favor be, or the outcome be in my favor. And once I started to turn that around and, and, and be there for myself, as a male energy, like be, be the male parent to myself. It started to change that for me. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So I, I don't know if maybe that resonates with you. Maybe it doesn't, but that's been my experience. No, it totally does. Um, that's fast. It's a fascinating way to look at it. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, like, cause it's not something I've experienced for a long time. Cause it was something I did a lot in my twenties and like in my thirties, I had, you know, tried to, you know, spend time with people that actually were kind and were like, you know, genuine and showing up and like trying to, you know, have some sort of connection. Yeah. So this recent, this recent relationships kind of thrown me for a loop. Yeah. And I don't know if it was just like, uh, I don't, I don't know, but uh, I appreciate your perspective and I, yeah. that's something I maybe should uh, dig into a bit. Yeah. It'll come when it's ready. Right. That's why I always trust in, in, you know, we're always learning the things we need to learn on our journey exactly when we need to learn them. So it's like, you know, just got to be patient with the process and continue to put yourself in situations where you get to learn and evolve. That's it, right? Yeah, well, we got no choice right now. I'm spending a yeah. long time thinking about all of that and like <laughs> what, what my relationships are going to look like, you know, post-COVID. Yeah, yeah. So your, your connection, desire to connect in your 30s, how, do, how does, what does that look like now? Uh, honestly, it's like the, the, the main thing that I'm 
that I'm looking to connect with people is like based up around kindness, like people who are kind in their day to day life, people yeah. that are thoughtful, people yeah. that listen and, you know, genuinely care about what you're saying and like want to get to know me and like vice versa. Yeah. Um, whether that's just like a friend or um, someone that I'm inter interested in romantically or people that I get along with, like in the workplace, like yeah. those are the, the connections that are meaningful. And um, I look at my, you know, my, my best friends and a lot of the people that I, that I have in my life, it's like, what is it about those relationships that, you know, makes it a value to me? And, you know, those same things should apply to when I'm, you know, looking for a partner or dating. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and I've tried really hard to, to do that in, in my thirties and um, still trying. <laughs> yeah. how, how have you had to change your ability to connect in order to attract those people? Uh, I think I, I used to um, really try to come across a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do I think this guy is attracted to? And I want to try to make myself seem like that. Yeah. Um, or oh. now it's just like, yes. now it's just, just like, this is what, this is me. This is what I do. This is like, this, this is me. I'm just going to lay it all out there essentially. Yeah. Um, if you want to get to continue to get to know me. Awesome. Um, and I, I would hope that they would do the same. And like mm -hmm. when, when someone does that, that's, that's what connection is. Right. Yeah. When, when you're able to talk openly about, you know, <clears throat> something that was hard or something that uh, was exciting or something that was scary uh, and have someone listen and relates to that experience is what drives connection. Yeah. <clears throat> That's why I love you so much because you, you are the, the very first gay guy that I ever had vulnerability with and shared that connection of realness with where we talked about things we, and I, you're the type of person that I feel like I could call you up or, or we could have a conversation. It can be about anything. There's no limit to the things we talk about. And it's, uh, it's really cool. I, I, I really cherish that about, uh, about you. Likewise, Maddie. Yeah, your vulnerability is your superpower. It really is. Well, yeah, likewise. We've had some great conversations over the years and over yeah. many Swiss chalet dinners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do they have Swiss chalet Our there? Faves? No, not. no, I wish. I wish. Well, it's waiting for you when you come home. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure. I will be there. Um, okay, so... There's a few things that I extrapolated from your, your TED talk that I want to talk about. So the TED talk is called Expanding Masculinity, Moving Beyond Boys Will Be Boys. And it has, it has 31,000 views on, on YouTube. That's very impressive. Um, Ooh, and it's I, such, it makes me so uncomfortable. It's, yeah, it's like the vulnerability <laughs> hangover, right? But um, it's, it's such a beautiful message. So I really encourage the, the listeners uh, to watch this 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 video because it's it, especially if you're a gay man or, or you're, you're somebody that's that's gr uh, grappling with your masculinity the, the it's a very raw open uh, dialogue that blake shares about his journey and uh it's 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 really cool but um there was one thing that you said that um and i quote playing the part of someone i wasn't and i, I want to know what you meant by that that was something I said in the TED talk or, or yeah. So you were said. talking about school and the, the young boy that, that committed suicide and um, how there was a part of you that just kind of, you were glad that it wasn't you and you distanced yourself from him. And then you t went on to talk about how you were playing the part of somebody that you weren't so that you didn't yeah. weren't seen as the same way that he was being seen. Yeah. What was that yeah. like for you? Well, it was, I mean, it's, it's super sad. Uh, to sad, think yeah. about that, like, so like I, I had this kid that was in my class in grade eight. So we were what, 13, 14. Yeah. And this kid was like <clears throat> unapologetically flamboyant. Like he was out there. He was like always, you know, you know, making jokes. He was always laughing. He was always wearing bright colors and <clears throat> he got made fun of a lot for being, you know, gay. I don't know if he was, mm -hmm. we were in grade eight. Nobody was, you know, coming out as gay or whatever at that point, but he got made fun of a lot. <clears throat> And I saw a lot of myself in him. <clears throat> I remember <laughs> we, we all signed up for band. <clears throat> and I was like, what instrument do I want to play? I think I want to play the flute. Not thinking like, uh, I just was like, that just seems yeah. like a cool instrument. I want, to play the fuck. I, want to, I want to play the flute. And yeah. so we all show up and like, we all sit and like get our instruments. And it's me and like 75 girls. And then this other boy, we, we were the only boys that played the flute. And I, I, and I saw all these like parallels between me and him. And I, he was getting it worse than I was because he was unapologetically himself at that age. And I, and I was a bit more um, uh, self-aware and filtered myself. Yeah. 
And so when I saw that, I purposefully tried to be like, I did not want to be friends with him. <clears throat> I don't want to have anything to do with him because yeah. he is he is the the example of of what I don't want to be. So yeah. I would try I would try really hard to not be like him. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he killed himself in grade eight. He committed suicide, and I don't know I, I don't know why. Um, I'm sure his experience in school and uh, didn't help the situation yeah. but after that you know i had i had a lot to think about and a lot to reflect upon that I, well i always will yeah. it's like why did i do that why was i not his friend in that yeah. time what was it about you know like that could have been a, a beautiful friendship that could have been yeah. you know because yeah. we had a lot in common but instead i chose to like you know be like fuck that you know and yeah. not be not be there for him because i was terrified i was ashamed yeah. of who i who i was and i was ashamed that i saw parallels in him. yeah um and it wasn't until i had to like you know <clears throat> look in the mirror and accept that part of myself and many parts of myself that i was able to you know actually feel a lot more comfortable in my skin and he helped he helped with that yeah in a in a sad in a you know in a heartbreaking way yeah those people are angels that come into our lives. I really do believe that. And uh, that it seems like that was a launching pad for you to start to start the process of your, your authentic authenticity and starting that journey for yourself. How did, how, what sort of impact did that have on you to, to, I mean, it was traumatic. It was, it was, it was like really like to, to, to have wrap your head around someone of that age, taking their own life at, it's really hard when you're a kid and mm-hmm. you know, I had I never knew anyone my age that had died. I didn't know like the only other person I knew that had died had been like an old grandparent. And then to have it happen so close to me <clears throat> was someone that I, you know, realized I had a lot in common with was like that. You know, it was just a lot to wrap my head around and, yeah. and something that I, I, had, I had to, I remember the, the school gave us like a, a phone call, uh, phone number of like a counselor and I called that person and like talked it all out. I don't remember what the, the conversation was, but it was, it was something that really, really affected me. And mm. <clears throat> we'll always like, I'll never, for, I'll never forget him and I'll never forget um, the way that made me feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, it's, it, it forced me to, to, to ex- accept myself really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That's heavy, heavy stuff. And I think for me, um, I get really emotional when I think about that, because I know for myself, suicide is it it hits home for me. I've had three people that have committed suicide in my life. And um, I also struggled with that when I was going through my addiction and um, at a period in my, my adult life, actually, in my my late 20s, I I struggled with suicidal ideation. And um, it's gay young gay men are the highest category of people that are are ending their lives and it's uh it's a real issue and it's something that you know is very dear to me and something that i'm doing the reason why i do the work that i do is very very much around that and i want to help people choose life right because life gets better when you start to live more authentically and you don't feel like you have to hide in a closet anymore right Right. Yeah. That was a big motivation for me to do the work as well. It's just like, I <clears throat> recognize that I struggled with that and there's got to be other boys that struggle with that. And like to just provide a, uh, an opportunity for young men to connect and talk and connect with each other on like this similarity, this commonality mm-hmm. was important. And I, obviously it's something that a lot of guys yourself and myself have experienced and, and I'm yeah. sure many men have, whether you're gay or not, like <clears throat> it's, it's a constant strive to, you know, to fit into a box that we consider manhood. Yeah. That's such a perfect segue because that's my next point. <laughs> I, I extrapolated that out of the, the TED talk too. So man box, and I put in quotation marks because you use that term. What, what is the man box? Why don't you tell us a bit about that? Uh, there, it was an exercise that I used to do with uh, the boys. And I would be like, when you think of um, a stereotype or like <clears throat> everything that you think it means to be a man, like what comes to, what are the words that come to mind? when you think of what it means to be a man and I would make a list on the board mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it would always be the same things. We like, you know, tough, strong, in control, uh, muscular, uh, successful money maker, mm-hmm. um, big dick, yeah. lots of sexual prowess. 
um, it, the, li the list would be more or less the same. And it's like, okay, so now I want you to think about if guys don't have those qualities, like what if, if a man exists and does not have any of those qualities, what are like, what are some names that that guy might get called? <clears throat> and then that's when you hear slurs like, you know, fag, pussy, bitch, mm -hmm. and all of those, those words that are, that those guys might get called if they're, if they're not masculine, if they don't fit into that box, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> teaches them that what they're doing is wrong and they need to change their behavior. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> yeah. And that was exactly my experience growing up. And I think lots of guys, you know, can identify with, <clears throat> if, with some of those things. And it's not to say that like, if you are a man and you are strong and you are tough and like, you have a good job doesn't mean you're you're wrong but it's just like we can't all be that yeah <laughs> like yeah. we can't we can't all be that guy yeah well and how much how much of that that um alpha male is repressing his feminine aspects right i really do believe that because the feminine the feminine qualities are about receivership and about um beingness and about you know masculine is cause feminine is effect right? We, it's about balance, it's about the yin and the yang. So when we become so out of balance, we become doers, we burn ourselves out, we develop, you know, all these things. And why do we think that, that women have a, what, what is it, 10 years extra on their life expectancy than men, something like that. And it's because men spend their whole lives doing to try and live up and prove themselves. Whereas women just, well, some women, I think more, women are actually becoming more uh, masculine energy driven because of you know, the pressures and expectations of doing as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's really fascinating. What's it your difference? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no I was just, I was just agreeing with you there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know what your definition of, of being a man or masculinity is like, you know, you've done all this work, like how do you define what it means to be a man? Yeah. So like in my work, there's a, a phrase that gets thrown around a lot around toxic masculinity. Yeah. And I, I was, I, I was like, I was really drawn to it. And then I started to think about it. I was like, you know, I don't think referring to masculinity as toxic is actually helpful Yeah. because I agree. masculinity, masculinity can mean a lot of different things. And I, and I don't want to say like masculinity is toxic because it's not, No. Um, it's how people show up within masculinity that, that can, that can be toxic. Right. Yeah. And how you treat other people is what, is what can be toxic. Yeah. And so for me, be be like i identify as a man and there's a lot of masculine characteristics that i feel great about mm -hmm. um and that's kind of what it is and like i don't put those expectations onto somebody else um i let people show up as they are and if i don't understand it that's on me like that's on me to 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 to, to figure out and it's like and that and, and by having compassion and maybe asking another person about their experience and like who they are and trying to get to know them and so i can understand and not be like you're not like me so i don't like you and yeah. you're wrong and i'm right like that's just not yeah. how the world works exactly yeah. i don't i don't believe and so for me being you know a man and being masculine is like allowing myself the space <clears throat> to kind of be all of the the man that i want to be and whether that you know is putting on a pair of high heels one night yeah. or going to play hockey like yeah. those are two things that are in my world and that's yeah. okay and yeah. um to, you know to understand someone else's experience whether they're um whatever they however they chose choose to show up yeah what about you what do you think i like that i um i have a question and then i'll answer it what was it like for you to 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 do drag for your first time to put on high heels and have that experience when because <laughs> i can't imagine that would be so therapeutic and there, there was probably just all sorts of stuff that came up for you what was it like and then i'll, I'll answer the, the very first time the very first time yeah. first, that was a long time ago <clears throat> first of all i looked terrible um <laughs> i got a girl to do my makeup who doesn't didn't wear her own makeup so like the, oh, if you're okay, gonna get yeah. someone to do your makeup you have to get someone that actually wears makeup. yeah anyway, yeah they gotta know what they're doing that's, that, that's a whole other podcast um <laughs> it was uh i dressed up like a, a naughty school girl and went to the gay bar and um I, it was like it felt super um uh vulnerable because i yeah. was getting attention that i had never got before like men were like yelling at me on the street like oh that ass i want to fuck you and like, things like that and like i was like oh my god <laughs> yeah like that's crazy yeah um which is you know that speaks to a lot of women's experiences yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis and so that was like kind of scary but it was also you know i could i i it was fun it was like i could you know act in a way that i wouldn't feel comfortable acting and i could say things that i would never usually say and, and like get away with it 
because mm -hmm. I was, you know, playing a, a I was, a, I don't want to say I was playing a character, but I was like allowing it this part of myself <clears throat> to just kind of like live for the night, yeah. which was, yeah. which was great. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that like there's there's like ther therapeutic benefits in like in in doing drag, whether you like go out and do a show or just kind of like put on makeup at home, I think, and kind of just like live the live that fantasy or, or be that that part of yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause it's there, it's there. And it's like a, it's like a release. Yeah. I and agree. And, and it's fun. Yeah. It could be very <laughs> therapeutic, honestly. Like I know for a lot of people, that's the extreme, right? So it's like, how can we, how can we allow men to become more in touch with their feminine aspects in ways that that feels comfortable for them, right? Some people it's do drag. Some people it might be just to even express a feeling, right? There's men sure. that are they're in their 30s that have never expressed a feeling before, right? They've never cried. <laughs> they don't allow themselves to cry. So it's like, you know, you know, it's there's so much repression in 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 the in manhood that it's it's uh, I feel for it. And as as an empath and somebody who feels people's feelings, I I sometimes I I, I can look at a man and I can feel. I can, I feel like crying because I feel his energy that he's not allowing to come out. And uh, I, I honestly do believe that I've done work in my life, my, my own personal, what I thought was my own personal work of crying and shedding, but I'm able to watch myself cry and shed and be present with it. And it's not me who's crying and shedding. I'm actually releasing for, for somebody either in my lineage or in my life that is suffering, that is unable to access that part of themselves. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really cool. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Very hard. Yeah. Feeling for men to talk about feelings other than like, you know, happiness or, or anger yeah. is really tricky. Yeah. Uh, they just don't have that vocabulary. A lot of men exactly, or yeah. don't know how to, you know, express it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, drag is, drag is something that I like to do every once in a while, just for, just for fun. I actually, I like to perform and like, that's just like an outlet for me. I have creative, a creative outlet. And sometimes that involves, you know, looking, uh, looking pretty fabulous looking fabulous lovely yeah um my definition of of being a man <clears throat> i think I, I i think a lot of my life i've bought in and my subconscious has a different answer than than my conscious my presence um because i still buy into some of the the ideas of what it means to be a man or especially around sex and um that sort of thing. But I would say probably my, my definition would be, it, my definition just, it, the, the word that comes to mind is fluidity, just allowing yourself to be, right? And, yeah. um, and just be who you are and hold space for yourself to be who you are. So I think what's actually happening right now in my life is I'm actually de-defining masculine and feminine I'm, I'm i'm taking away the constructs that have been told and taught to me from a very young yeah. age but what it means and i'm actually learning to be human being first and right. foremost instead of identifying with man or, or or woman yeah so that makes a lot of sense it's hard for me to define it actually i didn't realize that until right now in this moment that that when you spun that back on me that i actually don't really have a, a definition for what it means to be a man <laughs> that's I, not a bad thing yeah that's and I, I love that you said fluidity because that's really what gender is. It's it's a, it's something that we kind of flow in and out of. Um, there might be elements that we kind of flow towards more often than others, but it's yeah. like it's a construct, it's a social construct that we've been taught to just sort of abide by. Yeah. And then when that doesn't feel right, it's like you think something's wrong with you, and it's like I, it's actually pretty common. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Making peace with being. Um, more feminine has been a big part of my journey and uh, something that I'm really learning. And I'm at, a, I'm at kind of like the pinnacle of it right now in my life. And it's really cool because I know that my next partner that I'm going to attract is going to be um, somebody that's balanced in their energy as, as, a, as am I, because I think right. the, the difference in the imbalance between masculine and feminine um, has been a major factor of why my previous relationships haven't been successful. And I don't necessarily just mean the construct of masculine and feminine. I mean, how it expresses itself in the relationship right. and dominance and not willing to give up control and not allowing yourself to express your feelings. That has played a big part in my relationships and why they haven't been successful. So I'm, I'm looking forward as I do the work for me, on healing this stuff. I know that there's a, a man out there that's doing that same work and we're going to come together and eventually be able to kind of be in a, in a, in a successful relationship. Finally. 
right? It's like, I can't wait to finally have that, that functional relationship that just feels good, you know? Right, right. Yeah, right. It feels right. impossible sometimes. I know, but, uh... I know. <laughs> But, but it's all about refining the relationship you have with yourself and then everything else comes into place. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean like a, a lot of, all of us have a lot of time right now where we really can look inward and like, you know, start to like think about some of our, our, how we've shown up in our past relationships and like yeah. what kind of relationships we're going to be looking for moving forward. And like, I, I I'm happy to admit that like I've had issues with like being intimate or intimacy and in past relationships where I've been like reserved. Like if someone wants to be overly intimate with me, I'm like, yeah, fuck, you know, like give yeah. me some space. If someone yeah. is like that with me, then I'm like, yeah, and I try to get in. We've talked to you and I have talked about yeah. this before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now that like, I, I can't have that intimacy because of like physical distancing, like literal, mm -hmm. I'm realizing like how, how much I value it and how much I miss it yeah. and how, how important it is to me. Yeah. So I, I'm looking forward to like um, exploring that. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, and me too for sure. And uh, it, it, my journey's been all around self worth because that's what it is. The play on someone coming at me aggressively and wanting my my intimacy from me, it plays on my self worth because I don't know how to see myself in the way that they see me as a right. special or 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 worthy so then it makes me feel uncomfortable so then i push it away but then when i want to go at somebody and i want to feel the intensity of intimacy with them and they can't have that it plays on my self-worth so it's it's i call it the self-worth dance we're always dancing with our own self-worth and it's just the external is just the mirror to what's playing out in our own self-worth so a, a lot of my self-worth has been it's come through this this work around authenticity and developing right. authenticity, allowing myself to be seen right. by me though. That's the thing. Vulnerability isn't so much about allowing yourself to be seen by others. It's first allowing yourself to be seen by you. And when right. you feel seen by you and heard by you, that's where you start to elevate your self-worth and you get to a place where you feel safe to share with the other. And that's what true vulnerability, in my opinion, is. Right? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of Helped sense. a lot. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, no, that's, that's like a very good point. Yeah. Um, all right. So I have a, a game that I like to play with all the guests. Um, so I've come up with, uh, with 31 questions so far, eventually the audience is going to start to put some of these questions in. Um, and they're just, they're, they're, they're put on the seat questions. Like they're, they're, it's how much of me can I be? So it's an opportunity for you as the guest to practice vulnerability with the audience and share as deeply or as, as shallow as you want. It's up to you. You get to gauge up top for yourself. So pick a number right. between one and 31, and I will let you know what your question is. Um, 25. 25. When was the last time you cried and why? <laughs> <clears throat> Two months ago, had you asked me that, it would have been a very, very different answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've recently, mm -hmm. like this whole COVID thing, I've, it's been very emotional. Yeah. Um, when it all, um, I've been crying a lot lately because it's just like, I, it's, it's an emotional experience. And yeah. it's like, it's, it's unprecedented. It's something that we've never experienced before. We don't know what it means. We don't know where it's going. We don't know the impact it's going to have. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. It's, it's legit scary. Like, and I, I think about, you know, my my relationships and I miss my my friends and I miss my family and I miss my colleagues and I just miss you know connecting with people and that's yeah. I'm gonna get emotional talking about it yeah it's all right so I wish it just like two days ago I, I cried because I it's just been really it's been really hard and I yeah, I feel I feel lonely. Yeah, I'm very yeah. great. I'm I, I'm trying to focus on gratitude. Like I'm doing a, a meditation thing right now, where I just focus on all the things in my life that I'm really grateful for, which has been really helpful. Cool. Because yeah. it's really easy to think about the stuff that's like hard and challenging. Um. So that's <clears throat> that's been good. And I try to like have reminders. Like anytime I'm at a red light, I have to think about something that I'm grateful for. Or anytime I, you know, I things that just happen throughout the day. Anytime I hear a, a bird chirp, I try to think of something. Yeah. Yeah, anytime, anytime it snows, which is basically all the time, yeah. uh, I think of something I'm grateful for. So yeah. yeah, 
that's a long convoluted answer, but uh, no, it's I, a perfect answer in my opinion. Very recently. What about you? Are you yeah. going to answer that too? Of course I can answer that. Um, so I've, I, and I, I talk openly about, about crying and I've cried on videos before because the emotions come up and they come up and I just allow them. But um, the last time I cried was like probably the same around the same time. So two or three days ago, um, I cry quite often, actually. Um, I would say I cry at least once a day, um, maybe sometimes once every other day. And it's really just me tuning into feelings. And sometimes it's not sadness. Sometimes it's joy. Sometimes it's, I see something on For TV. Sure. Um, it kind of comes with the territory of being sensitive and being an empath is I feel things very deeply. And um, I used to shame myself for that a lot. And I repressed my, my, uh, my empathy and my empathic abilities. And um, it, it wasn't until my late twenties that I started to embrace them and not be scared of them. And I've, been able to make a career out of it because I, I can feel things so it's so deeply but um I can't even remember what it was like I would I, I, probably something to do with I was in meditation and I was just kind of feeling joy I've been feeling joy for the last two weeks but uh before that I was really suffering I was going through a lot of stuff um but uh but yeah but yeah thanks for uh for answering I always think it's really cool when people are courageous and practice uh being vulnerable um so I do something in each episode too called this is me tip of the week. And basically this is me is a, is an energy that people can put their hand over their heart and hold and say, this is me. And it's about holding a container of ownership for yourself, owning who you are. Um, and in this case, I want you to, to maybe share a tip with the audience that how they can own their, their healthy masculinity and maybe even own the things about their feminine aspects of who they are. What's one tip that you can share uh, with, with them on how they could do this? uh <clears throat> that's a that's a good question yeah and I take think, your time um, there's no rush because i can always edit the time out or people i'm pretty sure people don't mind a little bit of silence here and there too so i think something that i've been noticing a lot just during this 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 time is like people are kind of taking risks that they haven't taken before and like showing parts of themselves on social media because that's all we love have it. right now, right? Like I'm seeing it. friends, I'm seeing friends like, okay, I've, you know, I've never uh, played guitar for anyone before. So I'm actually going to make a video of me playing guitar. I'm going to sing, or I'm going to share a poem I wrote. Yeah. And people are just kind of doing that and like taking that risk and like, and their friends like, wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And I've done that. I've, I've made a few, you know, uh, uh, singing videos because <laughs> I was always kind of bashful to, to share that, but it's yeah. been really cathartic for me. And, love like, it. Love it. And uh, I think just taking those like little risks, that you know really like what's going to happen like yeah. if you make if you put a little piece of yourself out there like you're just you know like you're but nothing bad's going to happen it's okay yeah <clears throat> and i think we all need that right now and so yeah. i think i think just you know sharing those little pieces it doesn't have to be on social media that's kind of like what i'm seeing right now but yeah yeah it could just be like over a phone call with with somebody that you care about or whatever i think that's my tip Okay. It's been helpful for me. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, uh, I'll put put a little piece of yourself out there. Put a little piece of yourself. Take a little risk. Yeah, take a risk. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I want to obviously thank you for uh, allocating a time of or an hour of your time to share with the audience, share with me, connect with me. Um, yeah, I feel really, really lucky and grateful to be able to do this um, because I get to do like, it's amazing. I get to talk with people and like hear their stories and share authentically and vulnerably with people and get the same in return. It's like I've basically created a career where I get to do my dream, you know, live my dream. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Thank you for asking me. It's a, it, was a, it was very a very nice um request to get um and thanks for thinking of me I, I miss you a lot and i care about you and i think the work you're doing is um uh super important and super um brave and bold and yeah. uh I, I know that you're probably helping a lot of folks <clears throat> with uh, your videos and your book and your vulnerabilities so thanks mm. for having me on your show it was a pleasure i am Thank very you. busy right now so i had to really i had to squeeze it in <laughs> all of my yeah. social <laughs> <laughs> I'm social engagement. Yeah, my social engagement is why it was a great pleasure. So uh, 
And okay. thanks for having me, Matt. It was yep. great to uh, see you digitally. Yeah. Where can people uh, connect with you? If people re resonate with your story, they want to connect with you. Uh, what's the best way for somebody to get a hold of you? Probably Instagram. Um, okay. My Instagram is at Spence1983. Uh, <clears throat> it's a private I'll put it account. In the show notes. It was, it's a private account, so you have to request me because I was getting harassed. <laughs> by okay. past. that's another story uh, uh but uh but yeah that's the best way okay um, okay cool um and then one thing i want to give you an opportunity to talk a bit about hot mess because i know that that's uh something that is very dear to you um yeah very quickly i uh, i started a pop-up so uh, lgbt event thing so it's like when i i feel like the city that i live in didn't have a lot going on yeah and i didn't feel like there was a place for me to go out and like meet people and dance and so i made one myself it's like mm -hmm. this is the kind of party that i would want to go to and other people were like me too and they started to come and that was uh, that was in 2012 yeah um and so it, it's continued to be a thing i've got to fulfill many a uh, fantasy of like creating experiences. I've got to work with lots of really uh, exciting performers and drag queens that I've looked up to and musicians. And now that's all on hold, which is really, you know, tricky because that's a big part of me. Yeah. Uh, my, my entire career is events. And so that's yeah. all on hold right now, but yeah. um, it'll come I'm, back. I'm though. still, I know I'm brainstorming, you know, other ways of like connecting with people, but like, it's, it's, it's tough, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, you can, you can follow hot mess on uh, at hot mess Calgary. Uh, on Facebook or, or Instagram. Cool. I'll also put that in the show notes as well. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, again, thank you so much. Thanks to the audience for tuning in and uh, have a beautiful day. Thanks, Maddie.